Israel has been hit hard. Hamas has launched a large-scale surprise attack deep inside Israel during a major Jewish holiday. Backed by a barrage of rockets, Hamas fighters used explosives to break through the border fence enclosing Gaza. They then rolled into nearby Israeli towns with motorcycles, pickup trucks and paragliders. As many as 22 locations outside the Gaza Strip were targeted with some towns as far as 24 kilometers from the Gaza border. Though details continue to emerge, more than 1,200 Israeli casualties have been reported as of this writing, including soldiers and civilians. At least one Israeli military base was overrun and videos on social media show Hamas militants hauling away Israeli army equipment and even hostages. In response, the Israeli government has declared a state of war and Israeli reservists have been called up. A sustained military operation in the Gaza Strip is likely, but the violence could also spread to the West Bank and maybe even Lebanon. The immediate future ahead looks grim, but the rationale behind the attack is just as alarming. It has to do with peace deals, arms deals, nuclear deals, and most of all, it has to do with Iran and Saudi Arabia. But if you think the big players are dangerous, wait until you see what the small ones are capable of. Israel rests in a tough neighborhood where things tend to blow out of proportion quickly. In South Lebanon, Israel and Hezbollah are exchanging fire. If this continues, it's only a matter of time until Syria gets involved and then maybe even Iran and the United States. Before long, we could be looking at a new regional conflict. Using ground news, I can see that over 42 sources are reporting on this story. Interestingly though, 46% of the sources are leaning right, making this a potential blind spot for the left. Scrolling further down, I can see that the Wall Street Journal broke the news and that most sources originate from the United States. However, I also noticed that sources from the left and right have largely mixed factuality, which means these publications don't always use proper sourcing or may use loaded language that alters the context. But when looking at center-leaning sources, the factuality is the highest. That is the kind of stuff I look for to make sound judgments. Using ground news, I can easily filter through the noise. No other platform has such tools made available, which is why I advise everyone to bookmark the Israeli-Palestinian conflict page on Ground News. It has all the latest and breaking news you need. I want to thank Ground News for sponsoring this video, and I highly encourage you to check them out as a resource. Caspian viewers get 30% off their unlimited access plan using my link. We live in an increasingly complicated world and it's about time we modernize the way we read the news. Those who want to live with the wolves must howl with them. In recent years, the legitimacy of Hamas has been undermined by other militant organizations. Groups like the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Popular Resistance Committees, Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine and Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine have accused Hamas of being too complacent and too accommodating towards Israel. Since then, Hamas has steadily stepped up its rhetoric and actions to match Netanyahu's right-wing government. In both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, violence has steadily increased to its highest level since 2005. However, the current attack by Hamas is unprecedented. Israel will retaliate and look to prevent more rockets and infiltration attempts. Additionally, Israel will likely initiate a ground operation into the Gaza Strip to retrieve any captured hostages and military equipment from Hamas. That being said, Hamas has a history of detaining hostages for extended periods. Gilad Shalit, for instance, was held hostage from 2005 to 2011, and the situation was highly political. The Gaza Strip is also densely populated and filled with traps, tunnels and preset ambush locations. An Israeli ground operation in the Gaza Strip could be costly for both Israeli forces and Palestinian civilians. 
The last major Israeli ground invasion in 2014 resulted in heavy casualties for both sides. Even so, hostilities could jump to levels not seen in decades. But the strength, sophistication and timing of the Hamas surprise attack suggest greater powers at play. Iran, in particular, is the biggest sponsor of Hamas. Full disclosure, it is not yet clear how involved Tehran was in the planning and preparation of the attack, but Iran has plenty of reasons for wishing to shake the political landscape. Ironically, what the Iranians fear most is peace between its foremost enemies, Israel and Saudi Arabia. Consider for a moment the context. In recent months, drumbeats have been building around an American initiative to broker a normalization agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia. The deal would reconfigure the security architecture in the Middle East. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has called it the biggest historical deal since the Cold War. Iran has been looking for ways to spoil the peace. The thing is, Israel and Saudi Arabia have until now quietly expanded ties, but an official agreement would advance Israel's strategic objective to secure full acceptance and recognition in the Arab world. A peace deal of such scale would tap into new economic prospects in the region, making the periphery more integrated, prosperous and stable. And the Americans have been going the extra mile to get it done. But the olive branch would come with terms and conditions. One of the proposals, or rewards for normalization, is to bind the United States, Saudi Arabia and Israel in a defense pact, albeit separate treaties. Some lawmakers believe that this may eventually result in the formation of a Middle Eastern NATO tasked with containing a resurgent Iran. A NATO equivalent in the Middle East would support America in policing the region and therefore allow the Americans to reduce their military footprint in the periphery. A win-win for most, but mainly for the United States. Yet, this isn't the first time Washington has tried to create some geopolitical order in the Middle East. Back in 1955, American and British lawmakers helped establish the Central Treaty Organization, or CENTO for short. As the name suggests, CENTO was supposed to be what NATO was to Europe, a collective defensive bulwark against Soviet influence. Clearly, it didn't work. Coups, revolutions and internal divisions hampered CENTO's responsibilities and capabilities. Eventually, the organization dissolved in 1979. There were some other attempts to recreate something similar, but each effort failed miserably. The most recent attempt was during the Trump administration. The United States pushed for a pan-regional alliance dubbed the Middle East Strategic Alliance, or MESA for short. Its purpose was to restrain and contain Iran. But again, regional dynamics undermined unity and MESA never found its footing. The truth of the matter is that the Middle East exists in a complicated web of cooperation and competition. It is a place teeming with differences and disputes, even between supposedly allies. Moreover, due to hydrocarbon riches, local governments have little need for public income streams like taxation to upkeep budgetary expenditures. As a result, governments in the Middle East are detached from the societies they represent. Accordingly, political power in the Middle East is highly centralized and sometimes even personalized. However, when political turmoil erupts in the region, which it does every so often, the personalized deals are cancelled just as quickly as they were approved. For added context, only 2% of young Saudis support normalizing relations with Israel, according to the Arab Youth Survey conducted in 2023. As one might expect, reaching a peace deal hasn't been easy under these circumstances. Political needs shift as rapidly as the wind changes direction. The enemies of today could be the friends of tomorrow. Even so, to reach a deal, Washington has had to filter through the overlapping strategic interests that bring Saudi Arabia and Israel together. Iran sits at the heart of this calculus. Both the Israelis and Saudis feel existentially threatened by it. 
Accordingly, two separate bilateral defense pacts with the United States have been floated as considerations for Saudi-Israeli normalization. These treaties would resemble the military pacts with Japan and South Korea, which are considered the most robust treaties the United States has outside of NATO. Though separate defense pacts with Israel and Saudi Arabia would add some stability to the Middle East, regional dynamics would continue to undermine unity as they always have. Paradoxically, a normalization process designed to allow the United States to exit the Middle East could end up pulling it back in. It follows that defense pacts with Israel and Saudi Arabia would mostly be a one-way concession. America wouldn't truly be gaining anything from the deal. It would in fact be making additional commitments to a place it wants to leave. The only benefit for America is that defense pacts grease the wheels of the negotiations. For Israel, meanwhile, the stakes are different. The government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, more precisely, his ruling cabinet, has for a while been considering the complete annexation of the West Bank. The ruling coalition includes factions representing the religious Jewish settlers in the West Bank. Two political parties, in particular, hold disproportional leverage, the religious Zionist party and the Jewish power party. These two control the most influential ministries of the country. Itamar Ben-Gvir acts as the Minister of National Security, while Bezalel Smotrich is the Minister of Finance and de facto Minister of Defense. What both these parties have in common is their mission to recreate Israel into a Jewish state, stretching from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. And by controlling the ministries they do, Ben-Gvir and Smotrich have, for the first time ever, the muscle and money to annex the West Bank unilaterally. However, doing so would mean snuffing out Palestinian aspirations for self-governance and forcing them to relocate to other neighboring Arab countries. President Joe Biden has been in talks to keep both the Israelis and Saudis engaged. At the heart of the negotiations has been the faith of the Palestinians. The Saudi Kingdom cannot establish relations with Israel without addressing the Palestinian issue. One of the core conditions for a Saudi-Israeli peace deal has been to stop the annexation plans for the West Bank and the exodus of Palestinians that would follow. In exchange for Saudi Arabia's official recognition and normalization of relations, the Israelis would transfer significant land in the West Bank, known as Area C, to the Palestinian Authority. The specific places and territories are up for compromise, but it would have to be something significant enough to make a difference. Simultaneously, Israel would first freeze the expansion of settlements in the West Bank and then the legalization of illegal Israeli settlements in the same areas. Yeah, it's a deeply confusing situation, one made even more complicated by the recent Hamas attack. In any case, if certain parts of Area C were transferred to Palestinian control, the Palestinian Authority would form a more contiguous entity and thus be better able to develop local infrastructures and towns without affecting the Israeli settlements. This transfer is, in fact, provided for under the 1993 Oslo Agreements, which Netanyahu recently pledged to uphold. However, Netanyahu is known for walking back on his promises. So, the Saudis have requested the transfer of territory up front as part of a normalization deal. By all means, conceding parts of Area C would be a game-changer. It would effectively sterilize the plans for annexation. Plus, it would give Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman an immediate achievement on behalf of the Palestinians, which he could then use as political ammunition to justify a peace agreement with Israel. The same rule applies to Netanyahu. Securing a peaceful resolution with Saudi Arabia would stand as a historic peace deal amidst the backdrop of political protests and legal scrutiny. Normalization of relations with the Arab world is a long-term strategic objective for Israel. If the state is to exist, it must find ways to forge and mend ties with its neighbors. Eventually, the Arab nations will get their act together. 
they will develop and prosper, and if Israel hasn't fixed its relationship with the Arabs by then, the state's survival would be in danger. Peace with Saudi Arabia would, therefore, be a historic geopolitical win, one that could set a precedent for other Arab countries to do the same. For Iran, however, a peace deal between the Arab world and Israel would be detrimental. Whether Iran was involved in the attack is unknown, but much of its soft power in the region is built around the premise of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Should the Arab world and Israel come to terms, it would steadily disarm Iran's power projection. Moreover, a Saudi-Israeli peace deal would allow the Israelis to collect their resources and shift focus exclusively on scaling back Iran's influence. Saudi Arabia and a few other Arab states would actively take part in that geopolitical shakedown. It would be a fight Iran stands no chance to win. So. Even if Hamas did not directly follow orders from Iran, both sides likely acted in coordination given their common interest in disrupting the progress in the peace talks that were underway. Ironically, there are also Israelis who want to spoil the peace. While Netanyahu has his hands on the steering wheel, his ultranationalist coalition partners are in control of the brakes. Smotrich, who is arguably the second most powerful official in Israel, had publicly declared that he would not make any concessions to the Palestinians even prior to the Hamas attack. If the negotiations fail, Netanyahu's far-right cabinet members could interpret it as a green light to go ahead and annex the West Bank. Suffice it to say, the stakes couldn't be higher. Some 3 million Palestinians call the West Bank their home. If the worst comes to pass and the war in Gaza expands to the West Bank, or if the Israeli far-right cabinet opts to evict the Palestinians altogether, most civilians would travel to neighboring Jordan since it is closest and already home to a substantial Palestinian community. However, Jordan has for years hosted hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing regional conflicts, including Syrians and Palestinians. The Hashemite Kingdom hosts the second largest number of refugees per capita worldwide. Over 715,000 individuals are registered as refugees in Jordan. That's nearly 7% of the country's total population. Jordan does not have the capacity to organize and host another 3 million refugees. It would simply break the country. So, a Palestinian exodus would trigger international outcry, and more importantly, it would trigger regional instability and catastrophe, all by the northern border of Saudi Arabia. Still worse, the exodus of Palestinians would see pro-Iranian militant groups, including Hamas, seep into Jordan. These militants would then likely exploit the situation while Jordan is in freefall. All this chaos would benefit Saudi Arabia's primary rival, Iran. Mohammed bin Salman can't have that. Saudi Arabia is already battling pro-Iranian Houthi rebels to the south and the Iranians themselves to the east. The last thing the Saudi Kingdom needs is a new geopolitical front to its north near the multi-billion dollar future city Neom. Owing to this, the Saudi government is looking to avoid, or at least limit, the turmoil that many expect will erupt. Palestinian politics, meanwhile, is centered on the Hamas versus Fatah rivalry. So much so that it makes international negotiations involving the Palestinians exceedingly tricky since they lack a unified front. The feud between Hamas and Fatah has been so detrimental to the political landscape that the Saudis have been looking to bypass the Palestinian organizations altogether and negotiate on their behalf to settle some leeway for Palestinians living in the West Bank. Since the Palestinians can't seem to be capable of negotiating for themselves, somebody has to be the grown-up in this situation, and the Saudis have been doing just that. However, addressing the Palestinian issue and defense pacts aren't the only deals that have been floated. The Americans have also been considering to permit Saudi Arabia to develop its own civilian nuclear program. In essence, the kingdom would be allowed to enrich uranium on its soil, though with appropriate safeguards to reassure Israel. A Saudi nuclear program, 
one approved by the United States and Israel, would go hand in hand with the normalization of relations. It would open all sorts of commercial and security venues for Saudi Arabia, Israel and the United States. By including the Saudi geography into its strategic calculus, Washington could go about its plan to employ the India-Middle East-Europe economic corridor. Biden and his allies unveiled the corridor during the G20 summit in September, which would link India to Europe by going through the Middle East. Iran is excluded from the corridor, while Saudi Arabia and Israel are essential to it. A peace deal would thus bring the India-Middle East-Europe economic corridor one step closer to reality. The final contour of the normalization agreement has been arms sales. Specifically, Saudi Arabia has been pressing the United States for expedited access to advanced American weaponry. It wants nothing short of what the United Arab Emirates was pledged in return for its normalization deal with Israel, which would include F-35 fighter jets, MQ-9 Reaper drones and a collection of precision-guided missiles. However, these weapon transactions involve a complex set of negotiations. Foremost, the United States is legally required to maintain Israel's qualitative military edge in any sale to the region. The focal point has been the F-35 and its associated variations and capabilities. No other country besides Israel operates these fighter jets in the area. Tel Aviv wants to keep it that way. Up to this point, an olive branch between Israel and Saudi Arabia seemed likely. The attack by Hamas, however, changes the equation. It sets back the peace deal, if not torpedo it altogether. What was before is no more. The situation is hot. Far-right Israeli lawmakers now have the ammunition to go ahead and remove Palestinians. If the historic peace deal has any chance of surviving, Netanyahu must work to keep his far-right allies in check. The silver lining is that the political opposition has offered to form an emergency government for the time being. So catastrophe can still be avoided. All in all, the Hamas attack is pushing the periphery to a boiling point. It's been a long time coming, but geopolitics is like that. You either concede to reality or reality concedes you. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report, so if you haven't yet subscribed, now is a good time to do so. Just remember to click the bell icon, otherwise you'll still be missing out on our latest content. Thank you for watching and Sarol.